Hi, I'm at World Flight Headquarters here in Sydney, and this is the world's most expensive do-it-yourself full motion 747 flight simulator. And I've actually done uh, a comprehensive video on this, and but it's over on my EEV Discover channel, so I'll link that in down below and at the end. You definitely have to go watch it where we get a full tour of this thing, and also we go uh, flying across the US as well in this as part of uh, World Flight uh, 2019. But the world's most expensive do-it-yourself <laughs> full motion simulator wasn't good enough for the owner, so it's actually quite old. So right over there, which we're going to take a look at in this video, is the brand spanking new one, which they haven't finished yet, but we'll get a comprehensive tour of this because it uses all original 747 uh, cockpit parts, whereas this one's a combination of some original parts plus some uh, sort of replica type stuff that the other one Whoa, you're gonna love this. So anyway, check out the video for this one after you watch this. This is gonna be fantastic. Let's go check it out because we've got uh, the designer of the hardware and software system, which actually interfaces and uh, controls and handles all of this flight simulator technology. Let's go check it out. And here's the new one, which we'll go inside and check out. But here's uh, Rod Redwin, which you've, uh, who you've seen in the previous video. And he's the designer of the hardware and software solution that interfaces with this whole thing. Just tell us about this new uh, cockpit that we've got here, Rod. Thanks, Dave. Um, back in about 2013, Matt came up with the bright idea of, I think the old sim needs a, needs a breath, of, breath of fresh air, needs a bit of new life. The old, sim? Uh, the old sim was started before the year 2000. Wow. So it's over 20 years old now. The old sim was built out of tube steel, um, some aluminium and steel sheeting on the outside, um, various types of plastic uh, and perspex on the inside. The only genuine parts in the old simulator come from 747 Classics. So the control columns, um, the centre pedestal, the throttles, have all been modified out of a 747 Classic. So that could be a 200 or a 300. Um, versus the new one behind me, which is, it's as authentic as you can get. Um, so the aircraft or the cockpit was from a ex-United Airlines aircraft. November 193 Uniform Alpha was the airframe that it came from. Um, it was chopped off in Tupelo, Mississippi, uh, where it was popped into storage for a good couple of years because the logistics of getting the cockpit here to Australia are quite quite something. It's too big to fit into a shipping container. Oh, it's too it's wide. Too, too wide and yep. too tall or too long to get into a shipping container. So after they did a little bit more trimming to it, um, it was packaged up, it was shrink wrapped. Um, and there'll be some pictures that will show you of the shrink wrapped uh, cockpit as it arrived here on the back of a truck. And it came out from the US as deck cargo on a roll on roll off ship. Oh. Uh, it was brought out here as a, a wide load because obviously it's too wide to fit on the road. Of so course. the process to get it here was not uh, was not insignificant, um, and probably cost cost more than the uh, the actual cockpit did to have it removed from the aircraft. That doesn't surprise me. Yeah, yep. shipping's everything. Absolutely. Then when we got it here, there was a massive project to strip out all of the old Boeing wiring. Um, Boeing use um, a very lightweight wiring, some of it's copper, some of it's aluminium, mm -hmm. and it's got this awful capped on insulation around the wiring. Ooh. And why is that? Why do they have capped on? Oh, uh, fire? Fire retardant, fire. it's light. Yep. Um, so there are many positives for using that in an aircraft, but also when you're trying to work with that in a simulator, that can be a, a, that can be a nightmare to try and strip those wires, solder those wires and join those wires. And also Boeing's redundancy system, um, where single switches are connected to two and three different wiring looms. So the amount of wire that came out of the cockpit was huge. The amount that's gone back is significantly less. So when this project's finished, we estimate there'll be about five and a half kilometers of new wire that we've put in. Wow. There will be something like 150 connectors that we've reused. And they're lovely cannon plugs, which yep. we'll show you a bit later on. Absolutely. And we'll have crimped over a thousand new pins onto those cannon connectors. Um, and yep, we worked out the easiest way to do that was to buy a pneumatic crimping tool. <laughs> of course. Um, which, which saved a, a huge amount on the, uh, on the hands and the wrists over the years. The solution that it's running is using the SimStack system. 
Um, and SuperStack is an I.O. solution designed for aircraft cockpits. And it's, it's also what designed and built. It's what we designed and built. Yep. Um, so when Matt first came to us and said, hey boys, I bought this cockpit, can you make it work? Um, John and I sat down and thought, yeah, this can't be too hard. You know, people have been building simulators for, for decades. You know, there's got to be a simple process for this. We sat down and we looked at what we'd used in the old sim. And the old sim's using um, LED lights, and it's using very simple buttons and switches. Maybe the odd rotary encoder, mm -hmm. seven segment LED displays. That stuff's all pretty simple. But not authentic. Not authentic. And, you know, the old sim probably draws about, I'd say, 10 amps, maybe 15 amps total DC load. The backlighting in the sim that you're looking at behind me draws about 70 amps alone. Just the backlighting, Just the backlighting running at five volts. That doesn't include all of the other 28 volt incandescent lamps and everything else that goes into it. So all of a sudden, simple uh, solutions that had been created by people for simulators and for the I.O. systems just wouldn't work with the bigger, newer simulators. Then we looked at uh, some of the other um, con controllable logic stuff, um, PLCs and pokies and some of those other boards and products. And what we found is they were good for a specific problem or a specific use. They would drive relays, or a different board would drive LEDs, a different board would drive incandescent bulbs, then you had a different solution for, um, for inputs, different solution for rotary encoders. So all of that got to the point where it was a bit, it's just a bit complex for what we're looking at. Much of it was also USB. And anybody who's dealt with a USB product oh, yeah. knows that you've got to unplug and replug especially when you've got USB hubs, when you've got USB cables running over 20 meters because that's what it takes to get from the panel to the computer. So many, many problems with that. So what we decided to do was we decided to develop our own solution that used an ethernet interface. It was a stackable and scalable solution that did things like handles three amps per output channel. We've got up to 16 outputs on one card. You can stack uh, eight cards together so that gives you some pretty impressive current drawing. Everything's PWM based for the, uh, for the dimming, which means we can dim incandescent bulbs, we can dim LEDs, we can very quickly and easily switch between switched uh, supply and switched ground. And a lot of the indicators and enunciators in the aircraft cockpits are diode protected. Um, and you've got to feed the supply side, which will feed four lights. And in order to get a single light to illuminate, you have to ground one low side of the light. Um, you can't invert the voltage because the, the, uh, the diode will stop that process from working. Um, then there were also some of the other fun and games that we had. We encountered ARINC 429. ARINC 429 is a very interesting aviation protocol. It uses an opt octal label and binary data with a checksum at the end. But of course the octal label comes at the end of the string, not at the beginning of the string. There's BNR and I think uh, BCP or BNP and uh, multiple different multiple different ways to get the same data across and of course being an aviation standard there is no standard it's so loosely applied so there was uh, a number of instruments which we'll look at inside which were ARINC 429 we've also worked now on ARINC uh, 739 and ARINC 740 which are just different flavors for different parts and different uh, different instruments and panels and so we had to develop a solution that would handle all of this stuff then you throw in those fantastic analog things called synchros and resolvers. Yes, um, we might have another video coming up on that in the future. So oh, yeah. there's hours of content on those yeah. for, for just, just by themselves. But the short answer is it's a beautiful analog device. And as you know, when you try and digital, digitize something that's analog, you have all sorts of problems, yeah. especially with the humble synchro, which all three, um, all three outputs are floating and they have no ground reference. So when you try and move those from an AC output into a DC input to work with an ADC, you run into all sorts of interesting problems. Yeah. Um, then you have to generate the 400 hertz signal that goes to them, and there's a whole series of other, you know, other gotchas with that. Um, the other thing we've got in the aircraft cockpit behind me is we've got different supply voltages. Some of the instruments work on 28 volts DC, um, some of the instruments work on 115 volts, 400 hertz AC. <laughs> two instruments right next to each other will have two completely different power supplies. Yep. Supplying 28 volts is easy. Supplying 115 volts at 400 hertz Not is so a little bit more complicated. Yep. But 
eBay is a fantastic tool to find all sorts of interesting power supplies from there. So you develop this uh, custom solution, which then other, sim it's a universal solution so that other advanced simulators owners can buy your solution and hook it in. Absolutely. So we, just, uh, we started to develop this as purely as a hobby. And then more and more people came along and said, oh, that's a great idea. Can, can we get a handle of that? So what we ended up with, we had three foundation customers, um, one in Sydney, uh, actually two in Sydney, and one in India. And so they were the, the first production run of boards, went to those guys, and from there the, uh, the interest has grown. Now, we've got SimStack running in train simulators, in plane simulators. Um, we're talking with some people about some car simulators, ship simulators, you name it. It's a very, very uh, simple I.O. solution that's stackable and scalable and works at a software end to a whole different um, whole different list of software, simulator softwares. So this isn't just a uh, sort of like a do-it-yourself enthusiast level thing. This is for professional simulators, really. Although if, a, if an enthusiast had enough money, like we've got here, this is just an enthusiast. Market. Absolutely. Our, our market, we describe our market as a prosumer market. So the professional and high-end consumer. Um, there is some configuration work to do with SimStack. It's not a simple plug and play solution. And we found that because as soon as you make something incredibly flexible, trying to make a, um, a simple interface to, to use that with is very, very difficult. Also added to the fact that because we're using microcontrollers here, you have to put software or have to put code onto the microcontroller itself. So it's not like a USB interface where everything comes back to the PC and you can have a simple piece of software driving that. So you've got to have something sitting on the microcontroller and because you've got limited memory, because you've got limited processor capacity, you have to be quite smart about what you do. So there's a whole series of hurdles that we've had to overcome. Um, and some of the other cool things we can do is we can program an Atmel 328P processor over Ethernet. So we don't need to plug a serial programmer into it which is fantastic when your board is buried somewhere deep inside buried a simulator. Deep. I mean, this one's relatively accessible, but uh, it could be buried deep under the bottom. We'll go for a tour under the bottom as well. Take so a, Take you for a journey around the simulator yep. and you can see some of the cool Boeing over engineering. And the thing to remember is that the cockpit behind me is the same size and shape as the first 747 that ever rolled off the production line. Wow. The cockpit size yep. has not changed. And what we've found over the years is people have bought 747 classic cockpits and discovered that so much of the 747 400 components will actually just bolt straight in. Wow, that's amazing. Because this is, it, it looks like this outside panelling, um, but if you look under, as we'll uh, see, this is actually cut, cut out of the actual plane itself. Absolutely. So, or it, it was bolted in, right? So they just undo the bolts out. No, no, they, no, they get out there with a big demo saw. Yeah. yeah one of those giant concrete cutting, handheld concrete yep. cutting saws. And they will cut all around. They'll cut through the floor. They'll right. cut through the ribs, through the stringers. They'll go up the walls, across the roof. <laughs> then that you've got it removed. Then you have to lift the thing off. Yeah. Um, and they're not easy to get to because there's some, you know, several, yeah, there's something like 40 or 50 feet in the air. Um, other little things like the windshields. Each pilot's windshield weighs 90 kilos. Wow. Um, so that's something to, to get it out and that's something to get it in. Triple glazed and they actually have a layer of very, very thin, fine gold mesh in them, which is what they use to heat the windshields ah. so that they won't ice up. Yep. And also it reduces, the, makes the glass a little bit more flexible. Um, and with the heat that goes through there at at 36,000 feet when the temperature is minus yeah, of 50 course, degrees. You've got lots of differential there. Absolutely. Yep. Then you've got the pressurisation, you've got birds, you've got other things that you might run into. Um, so, yeah, triple glazed windows um, and uh, three layers of glass, the gold mesh, and some nice thick plastic as well sandwiched in the middle there. All right, well, I think we'll go, before we go inside, which might have to, we might have split this into two videos. The inside might be a separate uh, uh, tour and underneath, but we're going to check out your customised hardware here, and you're going to tell us all about the hardware and software solution that Absolutely. controls this. Let's go. All right, so this is the uh, configuration that's used inside this one. Rod, you want to tell us about this? Absolutely. So what you can see here is all of the SimStack cards that control the overhead panel within the, uh, the simulator. And we'll have a look at the overhead panel shortly. Um, you can see that there's little codes written on some of those boards. HYD for hydraulics panel, ICE, FIR for the fire panel, 
fuel, lights, etc. Um, so each board, as you can see, they look slightly different because it's the different uh, stacks that we put on them. We have a foundation board, which does um, 16 inputs, 16 digital inputs, 8 outputs, and uh, it also does some analog inputs as well. And then on top of that, we can stack output boards, which just do outputs, and input boards, which just do inputs. And also, hidden in there uh, on the start panel is a special customized proto board that we can use where we have to do some interesting things. And in this particular case, we had to interface with a 10 turn pot, which required 14 bit resolution. Um, and the onboard uh, ADC that we've got is only good for 10 or 12 bit re resolution. So we needed a few more extra numbers there. And so we had to find a solution that would fit into the stack. And uh, so we just put a uh, fairly simple proto board together which means that we can be incredibly flexible. And that's that one down there I'm looking at now. Absolutely. That's a little, yep. uh, little dip socket. You've yep. done some hacking there, nice. Yep. All right, so here's the module up close. So this is your uh, SimStack solution, which you developed. How long did it take you to develop or how long have you been refining it? Um, we're, we're still refining it and we're still developing it, like any good uh, electronics project. Yep. Um, I think the first one rolled off the production line in 2015. Okay. Um, so to keep Aussie industry alive, they're all manufactured in Australia, nice. um, which is fantastic. We've got a little uh, manufacturing plant that we use. Um, but they're only small volume anyway. They're absolutely not small volume. Of these, not yeah, thousands, yeah. So so yeah. so yeah, very very small volume, very very niche market. So um, what you can see here is a picture of uh, a sim stack. Um, you can see that we've got some pretty funky uh, DIN rail mounts on the side, which allows you to mount it quite easily. Um, for, those, uh, for those viewing at home, you'll see that there's a small um, uh, Atmel processor on board there. Um, it looks very much like an Arduino, uh -huh. uh, and I'm sure we could start to talk about uh, what constitutes an Arduino. Yeah, exactly. Yes, that has the footprint of an Arduino Pro Mini, um, but it's got a custom bootloader and custom firmware on board. Got it. Um, and yep, I know there's some bent pins on there, but this is just a demonstration <laughs> yeah, model. So You'll you, notice there's components missing and all sorts of other interesting things on there. So you did that because you originally used an Arduino at first to develop it, and then you realised, oh, we need a, our own to roll our own? Or? Yeah, look, we, we looked at what the best processors were to use, and the 328P was the one we chose. One of the reasons why you see them on in this form factor is purely because we can buy a completed board for less than the cost of a processor. Of course, yeah. So that makes sense. And it's exactly the same with the Ethernet module on top. Uh -huh. We can buy an Ethernet module for less than we can buy a WizNet chip for. Yep. So, so that's one of the reasons. Um, the term SIM stack comes from the ability for us to take a, another board and just simply keep stacking boards on top until we mm -hmm. reach a theoretical limit, which is about 120 inputs and outputs combined. Um, as you can see here, we've got different, different input solutions. We have the fantastic spring headers, which are fantastic for, um, uh, for development and very, very quick and easy to change. So also, you don't have to screw in the wires? No screws. Oh, that no. would be a nightmare on something like this. Absolutely. And one of the reasons for that is that over time and heat cycles, the screws tend to back themselves out, especially with vibration as well. Mm -hmm. Where these spring-loaded connectors, you put a little bit of tension on the wire, that's not going anywhere until you break the wire. Yep. Then we've also got these uh, other headers here. They're also spring-loaded um, and uh, they're pluggable headers so we can set an entire sim up with those. And would you believe that they're even keyed? Oh, so you can keyed, break nice. these fingers yeah. off, you can put a little key on here yep. and you can key them. And I think you've got 10 fingers there, up to 10 keys you think about the permutations and combinations you can right. have on a single stack. So the advantage with that is if you've got multiple boards side by side, which you will, then, uh, and you've got the wires and the, the looms hanging out here, you know that this connector plugs into this Absolutely. connector here and not this board over yep. here. Because it's so the only place that it will fit. you individually um, key each one of them. Absolutely. So that, yep. Yeah, and we, nice. we've taken a, taken a line from some of the aircraft connectors that you'll see shortly right. um, with the different combinations of keying and numbers of pins on those. Um, so yeah, so that's our, um, that's our product. We've got an SPI header on there as well, um, as well as various other risers that run through the board to allow us to connect a whole variety of different boards on there. Okay, tell us about the, uh, the drivers on here. Ah, the MOSFETs, yep, yep, sure. So the MOSFET drivers on there, um, they're Fairchild Solutions, 
Um, and what we were looking for was a MOSFET that would handle the current loads that we knew that we knew we would have to deal with, with a very very low RDS on value. Mm -hmm. And so they're the ones that we chose. Um, so I think there is an 8446 and a 7443, I think, but I could be mistaken. And they're designed to obviously be pulse width controlled, pulse width modulated controlled. And we also use a multiplexing chip on the board, mm -hmm. which allows us to daisy chain those boards together. Got it. And the multiplexing chip is controlled through SPI, so we get good, good speeds with that. Um, and all of the other um, resistors, diodes, and a small MOSFET on there. It's just to help us with the switching and to ensure that we can get the right frequency LEDs coming along at the right, uh, at, at the right PWM value. Mm -hmm. And as I said, each one of those MOSFETs is capable of handling 10 amps. Yep. We restrict the board to 3 amps per channel, and that's mainly due to the cooling requirement. Yes, those MOSFETs can do 10 amps, but you need one square inch of copper as a heat sink for that. Got it. Which means that the board becomes fairly large if you're doing that. Yeah. As part of our testing, we did run 10 amps through the board. We bridged the fuses. <laughs> the board got a little bit warm, but surprisingly, even with um, some peak PWM values where you'd expect the most heat to come, mm -hmm. the board was still not melting and still not falling apart. Unlike our very first examples and very first testing, uh, where we had MOSFETs falling off PCBs nice, because yeah. we were just the, getting desoldering de themselves. De themselves <laughs> yep, you'd spend five minutes with the soldering iron getting them on there, only to have them fall off, and you think, <laughs> why, why won't this circuit work? What's going on? Brilliant. So, so we had a lot of wonderful help from um, uh, David Griffiths, our electrical engineer, who runs um, a little company called Digital Graphics. And he has been a fantastic help with us. He stuck by us with the development. Um, and he had the vision as well to work with us and to see yeah, what we've got and, um, and helped us uh, bring, this product into fruition, bring this product to fruition. What's the logo? Um, oh, it's a plane. Sorry, it's a plane on top of the circuit board. Absolutely. Oh, well, there you go. I didn't get it at first. There you go. It took me a second to, <laughs> to realize. Well, you know what they say. If, if someone can understand the logo, it means you've got the right logo. So that's good. That's it. awesome. It. Yep. So you said that you can update the, uh, the firmware on this uh, because you've got a custom bootloader uh, via the Ethernet. Can you explain how that works? Absolutely. So we have a, um, on the software side, we have two pieces of software that we've developed to run with these SimStack boards. Um, one is something that we call SimStack Switch, which is a software switch. So SimStack Switch allows all of the boards to connect to a single piece of software, and that piece of software will then connect to the upstream simulator. And that helps us um, regulate and control the flow of data coming from the simulator into the boards. Mm -hmm. Obviously, being a, um, a microprocessor, if you send garbage to the microprocessor, it's just going to throw its hands up, reboot, and say, I don't know what just happened. Yep. So we need to put some software controls in place to make sure that that doesn't happen and to improve the control of the boards. Now, that software switch will also send a reboot command to the boards, mm -hmm. um, and it will also open up a TFTP port which is accessed by the other piece of software we have, which is called SimStack Loader. Ah. SimStack Loader is an IDE that we've developed mm -hmm. um, because we have a, it's a, we have a C++ style um, of code, which we've got some macros and some codes in to help ease the, um, ease the writing, uh, ease the creation of that code. And SimStack Loader allows you to write, change, update, and compile your code. Mm -hmm. And then you hit the upload button, it talks to SimStack switch, sends it out through the TFTP port, and it uploads it straight onto the board after it reboots. Got it. And the process to upload a new piece of code to a SimStack board takes about a second. Nice. And you don't have to plug anything, you don't uh -huh. have to unplug anything. Yep. It's absolutely fantastic. All right, well, let's take a look. Can we have a quick look at the software? There's some screen grabs here and just send those straight to you as well. Oh, yeah, I've got some screen grabs here. So yeah. what are we looking at at the moment? So this is the uh, SimStack Switch instance. What you see is you see all of the, the 29 SimStack boards. Which are over here, yep. And in other places around the simulator as well. Uh, you see the boards connected and you also see the IP address of each board, a description and an ID to help us, uh, help us with what goes on there. Um, we can also control boards, we can kick them off, we can reboot them, um, mm -hmm. and we can do also look at the data that's flowing backwards and forwards through the board, change the config, 
amongst other things with the uh, SimStack Switch program. Got it. So we won't go into too much detail on the software because it's it's not that exciting, I'm sure. No, it's, it's, it's software. It's software. Yeah. yeah, everyone's interested in the hardware. So um, uh, let's, well, that's, yeah, so that's the SimStack hardware. Um, we might, this might be another video. So we'll have a look um, underneath this beast and around and then go inside and talk about all the cockpit and all the goodness. Absolutely. And what we'll do yep. is, um, is we'll pop one of these panels out. Yes, uh, please. And we can have a look at the, uh, at the exciting stuff. So these connectors here are deuce fasteners. Don't turn it on, take it apart, as we say on the EEV blog. Uh,